Hi, everyone. So, welcome. You can connect to the, if you want to watch this in one of 65 different languages, Afrikaans being one of them, you can connect to translate.it, IQZWC, and you can, uh, the captions will be live streaming, it'll stream also in audio, so you can actually enjoy it in your own language. And this is part of the, uh, the standard Microsoft Translator services that is part of PowerPoint. And if you've got Microsoft Teams, you'll notice that we've also recently incorporated it there. So you can have a meeting in your own language now, which is, which is an important accessibility feature because captioning is not only for uh, visually impaired people, but it's also for people who their sight is failing. So you can also, with that, <laughs> yes, yeah, so, so what happens is that it learns the uh, the base um, words from the PowerPoint, but it also learns as I'm speaking, it learns me. So you'll see as it progresses, it will actually get better or worse, depending on the, the South, South African Hebrew, Hebrew accent. Uh. <laughs> so, <laughs> Ruth, yeah, so exactly. So you can actually click through here and also the URLs so of the slides that we're offering there, along with uh, a lot of other resources that I, that I promote, uh, ak.ms, DevOps Day, Cape Town. It will be also at the end of the, the session for you guys to, to actually use. And please tweet me up, though. I do 50% memes, and they're really good memes. I've gone viral about five times. And then also 50% Azure updates, at Rory Preddy. So let, let's talk about um, the, the point of this conversation. Um, at the beginning of all talks, you're supposed to actually tell the audience a little bit about you, about your, your journey, and you're also supposed to tell them about you know, enabling them and also give them a challenge. So a little bit about me. So I have achondroplasia, dwarfism, and um, I always bolt on things into life. So this is my midlife crisis, my 335R, um, which, like, you know, it's, have you ever seen a Starfield simulator? I once pressed it down there and just like, whoosh, and no, not again, not gonna, not gonna do that again. So it's, it's bolt-on, so the pedals, I had to actually drill into there, good luck to the next owner, and then <laughs> attach it on there. It's only failed once. <laughs> on the fast lane. Um, and, and this historically has also been how most people get around. So this is me speaking at the University of Bloemfontein and just pushing a chair there, and also trying to get coffee at one of my employers there. And you, you make a plan. We've also seen that historically with people with accessibility issues, they do the same. So this is called the sip and puff switch. So if you have only mobility in your, your jaw, you want to use the sip and puff switch to enable and to that made famous by um, Christopher Reeves. So he realized that all he needed was movement in his mouth and he could actually operate a computer. Similarly, if you have limited mobility in your arms, you can use the keyless keyboards. There's many of those. Th this one here, you can just rotate a little bit to, to get to what you need. Visual impairments, we've got the refreshable braille display, which is a marvel to actually watch. Um, and then we also have the screen reader software, JAWS and NB Access. If you, if you ever want an insight into someone who uh, lives in a, a different world, a different engagement model, download the software and switch the software on, on your favorite website. It, it is literally like trying to use a mouse with your left hand because the entire world changes. And this is also the, the point of this conversation, is that there is another world out there. What we, what we perceive is not necessarily the same as, as others. And I started this journey because as part of my midlife crisis, I'm maybe 14 a month, um, I also you know, wanted to go to the gym, and you, know, you buy a gym membership at the beginning of the year and use it like twice. Um, so I bought one of these special smart scales, and you put the scale down, you get kalchat, and you, you, you jump on the scale, and it, it measures your, your body mass, and it measures your fat content, and I was like, yeah, this, this, is, uh, this is not gonna end well. Um, <laughs> um, and so I put in my, 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 my details, so I put in four foot one, 
which is like to you Americans like 120 centimeters. I don't, I don't, I don't speak imperialism. Um, <laughs> and I, I put in my weight, and this is very interesting with the audience, because when I mention my weight, a lot of people start to actually do the math in their head. They go, do I weigh more than him? Do I weigh less than him? I'm 65 kilos, right? But uh, give, give or take, you know, uh, there's been some beer. So, so four foot one, 61 kilos. I get on there, and I, 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 the next bit of criteria was interesting because it had, it had a little crawling baby, and then it had a really big man. And I thought to myself, well, oh, this is really not going to end well. But I spent the money. <laughs> Let's see what happens. I'm not going to do the baby. I'm going to do the, the man thing, and, and, and I get on. And it's got a machine model built into it. So you can see the thing that says calculating, 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 and then it, and it, and it came back, and it's like, you know, said the most heinous, heinous words to me. It called me morbidly, I'm not going to use the word, but it called me that, and I was like, somewhere somewhere in a, in a design session, someone actually chose to use those words. Like, like hey, what we, should we do? You know, for the really bad ones, let's like shock them, hey? Let's, <laughs> let's see what, what, what happens there. But it was a little bit... It was a little bit like, oh, he's a little bit happier now, but... <laughs> um, but I felt a little bit like sad Affleck because there's, there's, there's nothing I could do. This, was a, this is a 4IR d a device, and it's the entire design process had excluded a, a large portion of the population. Not all of us are that way built. So I gave myself a challenge, and I've been speaking across South Africa uh, and internationally, actually, uh, on this topic, because it, it occurred to me that I had to actually make a, a difference because it was going to leave me behind. So the 4IR revolution is supposed to create this avenue for people with uh, accessibility issues, but no one was speaking on it. No one was even mentioning it, though. And I, I work for a great company that actually makes it 20% <laughs> of our KPIs linked to diversity. And so they gave me an opportunity to actually work on this. So what are we going to talk about today? So three simple points. We're going to look at inclusive design. S that scale, how to make it better, how to, how to design for accessibility. We're going to look at website standards, because website really is the, the entry point, and I think it was um, the creator of the web said that the, it's the entry point to most people's lives, web. And then we're going to look at how, with that, with website standards, how you can actually incorporate accessibility into your DevOps pipelines. Just launched last week. And I love having these little moments of, you know, that there is a, a divine presence that someone launches software that I'm speaking of the week before, and I quickly go, I'm going to do a demo on this, just need to speak to the engineers because nothing's really working. <laughs> and finally, we're going to talk about AI which is really machine learning and PowerPoint. Okay. <laughs> because we've got this push to AI, but what about if we never teach AI on how to be accessible? What is it going to build? We're going to have that same scale that no longer is aware that it's not really catering for the, the average. Sorry, it's catering for the spectrum, but it's catering for the average. So inclusive design. This is a very old concept. It's actually called user-centered design. In the 1920s, the US Air Force started designing cockpits, and they said, let's take a survey. They took a survey of 4,000 pilots, and they said, cool, and we're going to design the cockpit for the average person, right in the center. In the 1940s and 50s, a lot of pilots started to die. They lost 300 pilots. And they went back into it in the 50s. They did an entire synopsis and said, what's going on? People couldn't actually see over the, the cockpit. They said, no, that's not possible. We, we, we coded for the design, for the average. And they went back and they said, okay, cool, show me the persona that is on average. And out of those 4,000 person, when they, they put their, their line in the sand, that person didn't exist. So the, the cockpits were impossible to use. And user-centered design has actually flowed into our everyday life because that those cockpits, the ability to move your chair up and down and everything then came into cars. So user-centered design is actually based in your cars. And it's the pro design of products, services, and environments so that everyone, including people with disabilities, can fully experience. And think of the cars. The minute that we made it a million possibilities with a car, 
we didn't code for the average. We didn't bolt down the seat and make it only available for, for one person. We made it available for everyone. Now, what happens then is once you do that, the process to get to innovation happens. Once you start to think outside the box, you have inclusive product and service design, accessibility, compliance, productivity, you reach innovation. I'll show you how, though. Because you start to actually think outside and for a broader audience. It starts also with the definition of disability. So, have you ever been to a doctor and you say, you know, doctor, I don't feel too good, and he says to you, I'm terribly sorry, you have disability. It doesn't actually exist. It's like, actually, I went to the doctor and he said, sorry, you've got the 40s, you know, you're gonna, it's uncurable. <laughs> because disability is not a personal health condition. It, it doesn't exist, just like that medium uh, in the cockpit, because it's a mismatch human interaction. And I, I learned this lesson uh, um, in, a, in a novel way, because I said to my, my son, who's also short like me, so I said to him, um, get on the scale, and I bought a new scale, and daddy's going through a midlife crisis, and let daddy grow his hair long and do a motorcycle, but no, not, not. I can't fit on a motorcycle, it's very frustrating. <laughs> and I said to him, get on the scale, and I want to teach you, teach you a life lesson, and, and he got on the scale, so he's also coming to terms with his disability. So I said, when, when do you feel disabled? I said, the scale doesn't, he said, the scale doesn't understand me, it's, uh, but do you feel disabled when you're off the scale? No, it's only on the scale that you actually are aware of it because it's the disability is only the mismatch human interaction. It's only when you realize that you can't engage with something that you feel disabled. And in my case, it's reaching for the coffee or the tequila often, and because, you know, we have small kids, my wife puts it right at the top there. <laughs> and I tell her, they can climb better than me. This is you know, defeating the purpose. <laughs> so then I say to my son, okay, please go get my tequila at the top there. <laughs> <laughs> Little kids, though, they can climb. So let's look at the inclusive design steps. Recognizing ex exclusion. It's very interesting because we, at our office in Microsoft, we're actually doing a, a refresh, and we have limited accessibility, but we have some accessibility for wheelchairs, but we have no people in wheelchairs. So I approached the HR and I said, we're going we're to create a, an organization to drive accessibility across the whole Middle East and Africa, but I said, I want to start with pregnant women. And they, they looked at me like, but pregnant women aren't disabled, Rory, and I go, your doors are impossible to open, and you're, not, you're being exclusive from pregnant women, because they're, they're your main population inside your building that are suffering. And they go, wow, we didn't realize that there are temporary, temporary accessibility um, denied. So recognize exclusion. Solve for one extent to many. If we make the door easy to open for pregnant women, we're not only solving it for pregnant women, we're also solving it with, for people who have mobility issues. And I'll show you ex exactly now with a, with a persona exercise there. But if you solve to one, you extend to many, it's an important factor because if you go to your manager and you say to them, I, I need to code for disabilities, there's, there is not enough money to do that. So user center design actually says, look at the broader picture, open your mind. And finally, learn from diversity. Once you have that, you can actually start on innovation. For example, a lot of the tooling was catered for the visually impaired. As a benefit, what we found is a lot of our tooling got better with the elderly, because we're all going to have failing sight. So let's do the persona spectrum. So these are from the US Center uh, of Stats for Disabilities, and it breaks the personas into categories. So this is category for limited mobility. And the, the, the classic kind of uh, use case is that you have an amputee with one arm, then you have a arm injury, and then finally you have a new parent. And any of you who have been new parents before know that it is a crippling disability actually. <laughs> Financially, <laughs> emotionally, <laughs> crippling. Um, and, and so, you can, you can have a meeting and you can say, we want to cater for the one-armed people, but there's only 26,000 
of them in the United States. You can have a meeting and you can have uh, cater for the temporary, there's only 13 million of them in the United States. And then what about the situational? There's 8 million. So catering for the first one, you don't cater for the actual physical disability, you don't match it to the disability. You match it to actually to the persona spectrum. And then you have 21 million people. Statistically, one out of every, I think it's five people have an accessibility requirement. But it gets closer to actually one out of three when you look at color blindness, uh, temporary disability, um, ADHD, all of these other issues. Now, one out of three people have these requirements, but what about their family, their friends, their, their individual, their loved ones? We're all, if you, if you want to know the biggest advocacies for accessibility that are found, it's not the people with the accessibility requirements, it's their friends and families. So to cater for this, we, we, we've worked it out, it's half the world. So if you cater for accessibility, you're actually designing for half the planet, for nearly three billion people. So how do you do this? So the first thing you start is with your persona spectrums, you map out your journeys. User experience, UX, the, in Cape Town you, you guys love UX. So. And you, you design, in this example here, a website, I think the colors have gone a little bit wrong there. So a website, shopping cart experience, there's supposed to be a line there, site landing, preferences, registration, help, login, search products, add to cart, uh, accessible help, checkout, shipping, and experience. You take your personas there and you superimpose them in color there over your journey. And what you find out is that you, you're playing these, these matching games. So suddenly now when you land on your website, you need to be responsive. Most people with accessibility requirements without an arm, they can't operate it in portrait. They need it uh, landscape. So you start to think differently. Innovation starts to happen. A capture. Not one of those terrible captures. I know what Google's trying to do with those captures, actually. They're trying to get me. I'm not a machine learner. <laughs> Single sign on voice search, call back, one button access, and right at the end, and we're seeing this happen, is AI adjustment. To change the journey according to the person's individual accessibility requirements. And that's an important change because that is creating dynamic innovation based on the user's individual requirements. And we've seen that happen also with, I don't know if you guys are aware of TensorFlow.js, that you can have a deep learning model inside your browser, and it learns on the fly. And I'll give you an example over there. And that, you can actually scan the person's movements, their facial features, their hand signals, and change the entire experience around their individual requirements. Let's look at website accessibility as our demo. So to start off, what is the big push to create website accessibility? So there's always, there's always the stick and carrot. There's always the humanist, uh, altruistic outlook, and said best by Bill Gates. For most of human history, we put our innovative capacity into improving the quantity of life. Because we're living longer, our focus is starting to shift towards improving the quality of life. We've evolved uh, carrot. But we have stick. We've seen how stick worked with GDPR, with everything saying, uh, I'm gonna use cookies now, but you used cookies before. What are you, what are you doing now? You can use better cookies? Like NASA cookies? Why are you telling them? Get that pop out out of my face, please. So legislation, so the US Century Integrated Digital Experience Act, which actually says that publicly facing websites have to be, and mobile sites have to be accessible by 2020. The EU also, EU Parliament Directive on Digital Accessibility also said that. The Canadians went a little bit crazy and they said publicly facing websites that aren't accessible now are going to be fined $100,000 a day. It's the same as GDPR, they'll shut your company down if you're not GDPR compliant. And it's the same with accessibility. By 2020, next year, th this storm is coming. Mobile and websites will be accessible. And you have to conform to a CAG, 2.1, cannot triple A, but AA. So don't panic, okay? We're not gonna take your, your jobs. But what is WCAG? So it's very old. It was actually released in 1999. You know, when I actually, I actually was one of those people who put in the, the floppy disks into people's drives and said, you're Y2K compliant. Uh, what does that mean? I don't know, I'm just making money off you, you know. It's, 
it's all good in the hood. You're not going to die in a fiery death. It gives 14 guidelines and, and 62 checklists for classic accessibility requirements. Released in 2.0, 2008, more principles, su success criteria. And then finally, they realized something. They realized that the majority of the world actually wasn't atypically uh, disabled. They started and they created the WCAG 2.1, which included mobility, low visibility, and learning disabilities, ADHD. So to cater for accessibility requirements, you're going to have to cater for ADHD, make your website accessible. There's also compliance levels. Level A deals with most basic website accessibility features. Level AA, which is most where what legislation actually mandates. And then finally, level AAA. Now, this is actually catering for disabilities and making it easier to use for the disabled population. It has four accessibility principles. Perceivable, can you use it? Operable, sorry, uh, perceivable, can you see it? Operable, can you use it? Understandable, can you understand it? And robust, it won't break future technologies. And let's look at some examples for all of those four categories. One, perceivable. So this is an apex predator, the, the house cat. <laughs> but also in perceivable, you want to give it an alternative text because the screen reader can't actually pick up that that's a cat. And then you want to say it alt text, so that's perceivable. Perceivable also. So one out of 20 men are colorblind. One out of 200 women are colorblind. That's an accessibility requirement. So you shouldn't really use color to indicate alerts or errors. So this is one site that does, and another site, what if you were colorblind, what it would look at. Perceivable is also important with captioning. So this is my hero, Ron Swanson from Parks and Recreation. And if you know him, he's a very serious person, and he does not laugh. And when he does, it's the weirdest sound. But we, we're captioning right now, we're using AR to caption, and we've got all of these captioning tools that are available. And one of the requirements for WCAG 2.1 is to caption your videos. It's a simple request, caption your videos, and there's a lot of tools around that. We actually have um, a very nifty tool that I caption, you'll see a video myself from, and you can change the captions we, we sing a big drive there to cater for your nuances in your accents. Because I couldn't understand with, with the captioning when, when I captioned myself, brew, why it couldn't actually come through. Because the nuances are also for accessibility coming down for accessibility tooling. We're doing uh, reinforcement learning in captioning. Hyperlinks, so let's do usable. So this is an example of a really, really bad hyperlink. But how many times have you put a hyperlink as the actual alternative text as click here? What do you think the screen reader is going to say when it actually goes over that? It's not going to know the visually impaired person on how to actually use that hyperlink or where it's going. My favorite keyboard, the usable keyboard. That's the Stack Overflow, uh, Stack Overflow keyboard, though. Because honestly, like I'm going to Google it first, and then I'm going to go back to it. So, but. Try going to your website, try going to your app. Just connect the mouse. Just actually navigate through with your keyboard. What's important to understand is that if you're not able to do that, you should just stick to the standards of keyboard navigation. And I'll show you how with tab indexes. So let's do a little bit of an HTML demo. So I've got a very clean, semantically correct site there. It's got the, the heading, the p tags, and then I've got a list, semantically correct for a, for a list. But I can also do the exact same HTML in incorrect semantics. To me, viewing that would be the exact same. To someone who's using accessibility tooling, it would be unnavigable now. We also have understandable. So one of my pet projects, if you follow me on Twitter, at Rory Preddy, is to do uh, funny volume controls. 
incorrect or impossible to use volume control. So this first one there, you have to pump the volume <laughs> button up to get it correct. The second one, you have to shout the level of loudness <laughs> into your control to get it there. And finally, I couldn't, I couldn't even get the volume up on this. You have to be able to have gear ratios, stick for our American friends, and get the correct gear ratio to get it perfectly there. But the, the important thing to understand is that we're now seeing a push to cater for accessibility requirements for ADHD. And we've created a service, a cloud-based service called Immersive Reader, which is actually available in Office there. And Immersive Reader shuts everything down except the line you're reading, puts it in a nice dark mode, and then also gives you a grayscale across that. Because for a lot of people, the normal web is, a web is a frightening place. It's an overwhelming place, especially for, for children starting to read. And then it can break it up into syllables, and also it gives you a picture, so you can mouse over the word and it'll give you the actual picture that. We're finding that works great in schools, but also for people who have cognitive disabilities. Robust scalable. That's another apex predator there, the wiener dog. I've only been bitten by two dogs, and that's one of them. <laughs> I, I think that dogs don't understand me, because they look at me and go, am I supposed to eat it? Am I supposed to kill it? What am I supposed to do with it? But you're supposed to have robustness, because half of people with accessibility requirements actually use their, their phones there. So robust, because if you tilt your page and it's broken, then you'll page was actually broken to start with. So let's look at also WCAG, the, the high-level ARIA. Did you ever wonder what happened to HTML5? It's an important discussion. Why did we wait so long between HTML4 and HTML5? No one can actually say, though, because there wasn't anything, there wasn't a, a step in evolution to actually cater for that. So ARIA is the precursor to HTML5, and it's what HTML5 is based on. And it existed before because ARIA actually gives insight. It creates meta information on your actual HTML pages. So ARIA's markup, you've got role, state, and properties. It's HTML5. You recognize these tags? That's what HTML5 was created. And the first rule of ARIA, it's, you know how hard it is to find Lego, Lego uh, Fight Club references, though. This is the only one. <laughs> first rule of ARIA is no ARIA is better than a bad ARIA because it's semantically clean. Don't code for disabilities or accessibility requirements if you're using semantically sound HTML. Remember that clean HTML page. If that was clean, the screen reader would read it. The second of rule ARIA, do not use ARIA if existing HTML tags already provide the same functionality. So it's a promise. And also, you can see here with this label here, we saw that with the list. If you create the incorrect stumbling block, then people who use those screen readers will actually not be able to navigate that A tag. Okay, keep time, it's a, a demo time. So you can actually get this demo, it's recently been released. GitHub.com, Microsoft.com, X pipelines samples. X stands for accessibility, and X is the engine we use. We've got a, a company that actually manages and monitors and helps us with accessibility. So they've just released this now, and what this enables you to do, uh, I'm gonna keep the captions on, Visual Studio Code, best editor ever. We're just gonna run that here in default browser. So what X allows you to do, and this is Accessibility Insights for Web. So this is a basic page. Let me actually zoom in here. Uh, let's do the zoom. How do I do this in Edge? I know how to do this in Chrome. Okay, that didn't even help me at all. <laughs> Let's go back. How do I zoom here? Uh, zoom, there, zoom, zoom, zoom. Okay, now I wanna actually just go hit refresh. Refresh. Let's close this. We're going through a, an interesting time <laughs> at Microsoft. We're, okay, let's just zoom that there, zoom. So this is some, a page with ex some accessibility issues. So you can see there, the first tag, this, this is nothing wrong with that paragraph. And then the next one is this input box la lacks an accessibility label. 
text color, the next one is too low, and the button uses tab index greater than zero, which violates the best practice tab index. So if I tab through it, I wouldn't be able to get it. So the first thing that you want to do is we've got a Chrome and an, uh, an Edge add-on called Accessibility Insights. Now, the, this tooling we've just released also, this is the standard tooling that we've done for Microsoft's Office.com, Windows.com. I don't think Windows actually.com is a site. Um, the, the one that's for Windows. All of our publicly facing s websites, we've already been doing this. And this gives you three options to, uh, for engagement. One is fast pass. 25% of all accessibility issues will give you a report right there. Two is an assessment, an actual paper checkbox that you can actually give to your team to actually run through. And then there's some ad hoc toolings to switch off colors, to go through tab index, to do a lot of nice tooling. So we're going to run FastPass right now on that static page. And this is offline also. So it gives me, hey, the color contrast is bad, the label is wrong, but it also highlights there. You can screenshot it and send it through to your, your team. You can also click on here and you can file an issue into your, your issue tracker there. So you can link it through to your testing. So this is the manual testing, and it's identify those two issues there. But what about DevOps? So in my project here, I've got the sample web page, and I'm going to attempt a, a very brave live coding demo run by macros, because I've been in the industry way too long. And this over here, we're going to create a pipeline. And then we're going to plug this pipeline into Azure DevOps. So we've seen that page there. And I want to start off with a basic accessibility test. So I run my first macro. And in this code here in C Sharp, I'm importing Fluent Assertions, the X libraries. I have my actual page. And I use. Start browser to start my Chrome browser. Stop browser, and then load the test page. So I've got my basics of my test fixtures done. I then say, hey, wait a second. I want to run the, the start of the, the tests. So I test the accessibility uh, ins uh, insights of a single element. I build my X builder, and then there shouldn't be any accessibility requirements, because all I'm doing is I'm testing one accessibility feature, the example accessibility element. If you remember in the first page, I actually had a correct element there. So that's the first test case, and that should work. The second one, oh, oh. this is what happens when you're not used to a touchpad. Yeah, I'll speak to the engineering team there. They, they, they need to make that easier. Um, test accessibility of a single element. Uh, we'll just make sure that it's in the correct bracket. Brackets are important, actually. DevOps 2 of a single element. I think I did that already. And then finally, we want to actually run WCAG compliance. So over there, we want to test the WCAG compliance. So remember when I said to you what's coming by 2020? If you can just run it in the accessible um, pipeline. And then finally, also, the last test case. You want to disable certain rules. Because what's important to understand is that no one wants to shame the page into not working or not being accessible. So that's an important concept. So you can tweak it to get it to work. So once you have that on the actual site, it's linked into the, uh, where are we here, X pipelines. And the X pipelines here will start up Chrome. It will run your actual steps. And also on Azure DevOps, it will run .NET Core. So you can actually go through to that on your X pipelines, uh, let's go there, X pipelines example. And you'll see here, it actually links it through to your, okay, we did the C sharp driver sample. Succeeded.
And you can see there, it ran it with Chrome and Firefox, prepare job, check out, install, .NET call, restore, test. And then you can get your test case scenarios there. Also, if you click through there, it will give you your, an email to your team to run your DevOps labs. So those rules that we did with FastPass, you can tweak them, you can adjust them, and it's part of your standard pipeline. Now, you can run it standalone via your standard uh, .NET tests, or you can actually run it inside your DevOps pipelines. AI for accessibility. We have a fund, $75 million, that if you have a good idea for AI accessibility, you can apply to the fund, and we can actually uh, cater for your AI project. This is very important to us, because we, we understand that AI and accessibility go hand in hand. So I've been using, kind of abusing AI in accessibility for a while, so one of my pet projects was to actually show that I'm not related to Peter Dinklage. <laughs> and you can see there that the AI says that the confidence level's high, that these people are two different people. I also once tried to create a pass the butter robot, a Rick and Morty pass the butter robot with Alexa. And the, the interesting thing is that in the demo, I kept on screaming at it because Alexa couldn't understand not being frustrated because Alexa doesn't and didn't have emotions at the time. But we're seeing a move to creating emotionally aware AI because emotionally aware AI will cater better for accessibility. What we want to do is cater for a world that, uh, that actually matches everyone's requirements, like these stairs. If you have accessibility requirements, you can go through the pathway, else you can climb the stairs. But what we also want to do is the world that adapts to you, and we need AI for that journey. We definitely don't want to do this, though. <laughs> we may have created one or two robots, which we're not really um, proud of, though, so we're, we're taking a step back. Part of the journey with AI is to understand sentiment and analysis. So sentiment analysis is to say that the person's happy or sad, but we also acknowledge that sentiment analysis is not a binary zero or one. So this is the emotional spectrum, and this is important because it understands that if you want to train an AI to understand accessibility, you also need to understand the human-based emotions. So my fascination with this is that the purple, boredom, disgust, and loathing. So boredom comes before disgust comes to loathing. Have you ever wondered why children can't, don't want to be bored? They get physically sick. Scientists have worked out that boredom is an evolutionary trait to try and show you that you've, you're actually being poisoned. You should go out and you should find better food or do something else. So if you sit still and you feel bored, it's because Evolution has done that, but so that's, that's how complex the emotional spectrum is. So how do we code, to the, code that into AI? So we didn't. So we got uh, DeepMoji, MIT. They realized this was an impossible task. They went and they trained it on you. They scanned in 55 billion tweets, your tweets. And they realized you were actually helping us understand the human mind and accessibility in emotions because you were hashtagging with an emoji at every one of your tweets. You were linking through and helping us learn with your sentiment and your emotions. So we scanned it into 50, uh, one, 55 billion tweets and then we sanitized it into 1.6 billion. Broke it down into categories, but I'm important in these categories here, and that little face there. That little emoji here. Who can tell me what that emoji is? It's the I'm not impressed, AKA it's used predominantly for sarcasm, which is the hardest actual w uh, wit to understand. So if you go into deepmoji.mrt.edu, you can actually check that it understands sarcasm. So coming from Joburg, which we have questionable electricity, so I wrote that, well, you guys, I think, also. Uh, electricity is off again, oh joy. And it picked up I was being sarcastic. It wasn't being positive, because right at the end it shows there, I'm not, not impressed. So we have the ability, we have the ability to actually code AI to be emotionally intelligent. And this is important because a lot of the digital accessible uh, gadgets we have needs to be accessible. 
Siri, Alexis, Cortana, all of these things, if you scream at it and if you, you're having a frustrating time and you're not managing and you're, uh, you're battling, shouldn't the AI itself be aware of your, your difficulties? So we have an entire team that creates emotions for AI because accessibility and AI is important to us. Also, remember what I said on the browser? They created a smart as assistant with sign language for Alexa. So over here, this individual coded using TensorFlow.js his personalized engagement with uh, Alexa. So it could scan his hand signals and it'll talk to Alexa for him because he's uh, not able to speak. So let's look at how you can start this accessibility journey and learn from diversity. So we already defined uh, how to define your spectrums, but you also need to define with AI bias. And bias is very important because if you code something on one population, you're going to create a bias AI. And I did a, a, a session at DevCon and I created a toxic AI, something that, you know, I only fed toxic Wikipedia statements and it came out as toxic. Enlist customers to correct bias. You're tweeting right now, you're hashtagging, you're feeding and you're learning. The MIT.edu uh, um, app there, Deepmoji, is learning every day. Cultivate diversity with privacy and concern, very important. Balance intelligence and discovery. And finally, build inclusive AI teams. You will never meet a bigger advocate for accessibility than the person who is physically affected by that. And it's an important concept. You need to hire for di diversity. Once you do that, so we've done that, we create this entire di diversity team. We run diversity hackathons every year. So the first hackathon we created was Seeing AI. Well, the winner was seeingai.com. So this is an app on our phone, I think on Android, um, that actually if I were to position it over this room, would tell me how many people in this room. It would tell me if they're happy. It will tell me that uh, how bright the room is. It will read barcodes. And it's an important um, tool that we have given to people who are visually impaired. We also created this. Sean, my name is Ian. I'm Taylor. My name is Owen, and I am nine and a half years old. I only have one. <laughs> and yeah. I love video games, my friends, my family, and again, video games. Whenever I play it, it makes me feel happy. The fun that you get to have with connecting with your friends. You make your own rules. It's his way of interacting with his friends when he can't physically otherwise do it. When I'm playing with a regular controller, there's some things that don't work for me. It's difficult for me to use both joysticks and the D-pad at the exact same time. And it just slowed me down a bunch more while other people were like She's never had the freedom to play at the level she knows she could. I never thought it was unfair. I just thought, hey, this is the way it is and it's not gonna change. What I like about the adaptive controller is that now everyone can play. I don't even have to look at the controller and just be like looking at the screen like, hey, yeah, yeah. You never want your kid to feel like an outsider or an other. One of the biggest fears early on is, how will Owen be viewed by the other kids? <laughs> He's not different when he plays. It's a little challenging, but that's the whole point of gaming. I can hit the buttons just as fast as they can. And I think I can crush my friends. <laughs> no matter how your body is or how fast you are, you can play. It's a really good thing to have in this world. <laughs> and he's happy for multiple reasons, actually. So, what have we covered today? One inclusive design. Code for <laughs> spectrums. Don't code for individual disabilities. Two website standards. We've seen how to actually incorporate it in um, your pipelines, your DevOps. And three, AI. In 50 years from now, we're going to be 
looking at not only artificial in intelligence, but generalized intelligence. And we have the ability to actually create monsters or beautifully emotionally aware AI. So it's up to us. So if you want more, please, I'll leave the slide up there. Uh, DevOps Day Cape Town, please follow me on Twitter. I also tweet on accessibility requirements. And I think I've got some time for questions. Kubis? Two. two questions. We're running a little bit late. OK, so two questions. What did I do with my scale? Nothing, actually. I'm just kind of like, I'm just going to ignore the fact that I need to go to gym. I actually have a gym in my building. Like, you know, and I'm just ignoring Every time I drive past, I just go, you're not there. Thank you so much, powerful stuff. I'm wondering, what, now that people are inspired and want to make these choices, what's the, one of the ways you would recommend people start with making their sites and apps more inclusive? So I, I get a lot of engagement after this fact, and people coming and saying, Rory, I did nothing. I did nothing for 20 years of my life, and I don't know what to do, because I've created all these inaccessible websites and pages. And I, I said to you, but how do you know that? You need to start just by running FastPass with the uh, Accessibility Insights tooling. So you can go to accessibilityinsights.io, and you just run FastPass. And then you can just see where you need to go. This is a journey. Until they come with the big stick, and they, they're coming with that, this is a journey that you need to be aware of. Where do you start, and where do you need to go? One more question. No, OK. Um, so I, I just have a comment that um, the first time I heard the talk, I realized that the stuff's actually easy, and there's no excuses. Um, so like it, it's a challenge to start doing the right thing, and it, it'll all work out. Um, and then in addition, you can go further and, and go over and above that. And I think, I think all those, those barriers to be accessible are, are being broken down, and it really is easy. There's no excuse. Cool. Thank you, Rory. Thank you, Thank you everyone. Thank you.